Welcome to Everything Co-op, bringing you information on how cooperatives can help improve your quality of life. This show is being sponsored by the National Co-op Bank, NCB. The NCB is dedicated to strengthening communities nationwide for the delivery of banking and financial services for the nation's cooperatives, their members, and other socially responsible organizations. For more information on the power of community ownership, visit ncb.coop. That's ncb.coop. Now stay tuned for your host, Vernon Oaks. You know, this morning we're in Birmingham, Alabama, and we have the distinct pleasure to have Mr. Cornelius Blanding, who's the Executive Director of the Federation of Southern Co-ops, as our guest this first half of this show. Good morning, Cornelius. Good morning. Okay. Are you all set today? <laughs> well, we're getting set. <laughs> okay. Okay. Tell me. Well, first off, a little bit about you. You told me that your parents have a, both of them, a fourth grade education, and you were the only, the first one in your family that got a college education. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, first of all, good morning, Vernon, and it's a pleasure being on this show again, and I always feel at home when I'm here with you. Uh, but yes, I'm, a, I'm, I'm originally from Alabama, and my mother and my father both had me when they were very young. I married and had me when they were teenagers. And unfortunately, neither one had an education. They dropped out of school to start a family, basically. Uh, but uh, my father was able to go back and get his high school diploma after, actually, after I went to college. How did you get this whole get an education? <laughs> to be honest with you, I don't know. I think it came, I played sports growing up. And when I started being introduced or even understanding about colleges was because of baseball. And some of the coaches coming to talk and possibility of going to college to play baseball. And so that's when I started having those kind of conversations. Uh, but when I started having them, I, I soon realized how important it was to my mother uh, for me to go to college. Because actually, I didn't think I was going to college. I was actually planning to go to the Navy. Okay. And and had a recruiter, and the crew was coming by my house regularly every day, and we were all the way up to the point of actually, I was at the point of going, signing up and going to the Navy, and my mother broke down and started crying, and she said that I thought you would be the first one in our family to go to college, and that's when I realized how important it was from her emotions and her reaction. My uh, grandfather, sober or drunk, said, get, a, get an education, boy, get an education, boy. Get an, it, was, it was always instilled from a young young kid, and that was it. And my mother, too, very much played a big role in it. So how has this education affected, and how did you get into co-op with this whole thing? Well, I think education is, is as valuable as you make it. And for me, my perspective is that it's, it's centered around the relationship that you make while getting into education. Hopefully you're in the, you're in the room you're in the same space with other folks who have a desire to learn to get an education. And that is the bridge. That takes you everywhere. So for me, um, I, was, I was fortunate enough to be the first one to go to college. But more importantly, I was fortunate enough to be around a lot of people who had different ideas and different thoughts. And that led me to a lot of different places and seeing a lot of different things. And that, those different places, those different things, those different people eventually led me to the Federation of Southern Cooperatives. And that's when I started learning about cooperatives. About how old were you when you learned about Federation? Uh, I was in my early 20s. <clears throat> So it was not long after I finished college. The Federation was one of my first real jobs. I've, I, I've, I've done some interns and I've done some jobs here and there, but in terms of a real job, this, it was my first. Fantastic. I re- really wish I had learned about co-ops in my early 20s. That's great. I was in my <laughs> mid-50s. Okay, so <laughs> never, too, never too late, though. <laughs> so what is this? You're having your annual meeting this weekend. What is, what is that about? What are you doing here? Yeah, so... so uh, I'm the executive director of the Federation of Southern Cooperatives Land Assistance Fund. Uh, the Federation is a 52-year organization. It's, a, it's an association of black farmers, landowners, and cooperatives. In essence, we are a cooperative association. We are cooperative of cooperatives. Um, so as part of our organization, we're structured by primary cooperatives, cooperatives that 
of people have directly in their communities. Uh, we're structured as a secondary cooperative where we have the state associations or association of cooperatives based in each state. Uh, but we are we're also a tertiary cooperative. We are a cooperative of all of those cooperatives. Uh, so a very unique structure, uh, and this structure has been around since the Civil Rights Movement back in 1967, 52 years ago. Every year as an organization, we have an annual meeting. We first of all take care of the business of the organization, but second of all, it's the opportunity for all of our cooperatives, all of our states, all of our membership to come together and to really celebrate each other, to learn from each other, to network. And then we we have a good time. So we're here uh, for the 52nd annual meeting, but we're also here celebrating uh, Reverend Jesse Jackson. We have something that we've been doing for about 18 years now called the Estelle Witherspoon Lifetime Achievement Award. And that award is in honor of and named after Estelle Witherspoon, who was a founding member of the Freedom Quilting Bee, a quilting cooperative uh, down in Wilcox County, Alabama, uh, one of the poorest counties in Alabama. And that was a form, a way for people to move past their immediate situation and to live. Uh, but Wilcox County and uh, the Freedom Quilting Bee were one of the, uh, and Miss uh, Estelle Witherspoon was one of the original members of the Federation in terms of found, helping found the Federation. So this honor isn't named after her, but we honor somebody every year who's committed a lifetime of work in rural communities with black farmers and landowners and or with cooperatives. And this year we're honoring Reverend Jesse Jackson. Fantastic. I get this quilting bee, and I love quilts, uh, both they keep you warm and they, they can be quite beautiful, artistic even. So you have this dinner in honor of her, you named after her, and that's tonight. Mm -hmm. That's tonight. So what do you do all day, though? Uh, so interesting that you ask, because our annual meeting is an event. It's a, it's a weekend. It's three days, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. And for those and those of us who, who really like to, to kick it all the way to after, we, it's to, it goes to Sunday. Okay. <laughs> yeah. But on Thursday, we, we, start in, um, we start off with a board meeting, so we're really taking care of the preliminary part of the business of the organization. So we have a board meeting uh, this morning, every Thursday morning, prior to anything else. Um, then we go to wait, wait, just this board thing for people to understand uh, how people get on the board and what the board what is the board's function? Okay, so so for any organization, any business, but especially a co-op, governance is extremely important uh, and is required. But um, as a, as a federation, again, I told you we're a multi-state organization. We're a regional organization that operates in multiple states. We're actually states. yeah we're, yeah we're, we're actually chartered to work in sixteen states and the District of Columbia. Okay, but we have. Board, we've normally had board representation from anywhere from seven to nine states based on how active our state associations are uh, because they're the ones who elect our board members. So as an organization, we have individual members, black farmers and landowners primarily, but other rural residents. They make up cooperatives. They join cooperatives, organize their own cooperatives. Those cooperatives in each state have representation in that state and what we call state associations. So... I use Mississippi as an example. Um, Mississippi has 22 cooperatives in the state of Mississippi. So each, so our state association is comprised of 22 representatives of those cooperatives. That's the board of the state association. They would then elect among themselves one of them, one one, one person to represent them on the board of the federation. So we have board representation from right now seven states. Uh, so we have seven board members there elected from their state associations who are elected out of their co-ops. And they carry on the business of the organization. We meet quarterly. Uh, their, their main responsibility is to hire an executive director, a staff person to carry out the duties of the organization, the duties of the board. And that's me. My job is to hire other staff. So we have staff in all these multiple states to do the work of the organization. So my job is to really set the the agenda based on the guidelines, the vision, the mission, the framework the board has set in terms of where this organization is going. And that comes from their involvement, their participation with the membership. So that is the structure that governance is extremely important in a co-op. Matter of fact, any business, but it's extremely important in a co-op. So today I know you have a 
round table, a couple round tables at two o'clock? Yes. And so again, this event, this is an event for us. So after the board meeting, uh, we have a lot of partners, a lot of friends and partners such as yourself. And I know the host of this show is the National Cooperative Bank, and they're one of our valued partners uh, in this work. And so we have partners, friends and partners like you, Vernon, like this radio show, Everything Co-op, uh, like NCB, uh, who's in representation at this annual meeting and so we decided to look we have to take advantage of these op this opportunity we have people down for three days two and three days and what is it that we can do that we really maximize our relationships and so we do have a cooperative round table every year as we're on alongside a heirs property round table so as an organization our primary focus is around three things cooperative economic development land retention and advocacy so we help build cooperatives. We help strengthen cooperatives. Uh, so we have a round table around this effort to make sure we're bringing our cooperative partners together to talk about the issues that are going on in the South, the issues that are going on with our cooperatives, the issues that are going on nationally, and how we as an organization, as a federation, and our local co-ops, how do we plug into those? How do we be better partners, and how do we engage our partners in a better way? So our cooperative round table is around that. Um, but we also have an heirs property roundtable that goes on simultaneously, and that's about land. It's about protecting, saving, expanding black-owned land, one of the issues as an organization. Uh, but this roundtable is bringing some of those stakeholders together and talk about issues that are important in this land retention effort. And one of, one of those issues, the main issue for us is heirs property. And so this roundtable discusses heirs property. Okay, so I, I got... I got that, and I was amazed that in the 1930s, how much land we owned, black owned. Yep. It was some, some period of time, and then how much we have now. Do you yeah, know what those yeah. Are? So, so the statistics that we use uh, regularly as an organization are, is in 1910, there were 15 million acres owned by 218,000 black farmers. So 218,000 black farmers and 15 million acres of land. Before the turn of the century, uh, in 1992, there was 2.3 million left, 2.3 million acres left, 18,000 black farmers. So you went from 218,000 black farmers down to 18, from 15 million acres of land to a little over 2 million. You know, this is a good place for us to cut off to go to our first break from 218,000 farmers to 18,000 farmers and all of that loss of land. But we're going to come back and talk about, after the break, we'll talk more about what it is that you're getting accomplished in these next few days, including some dancing getting on. We'll be right back. Mm -hmm. Please don't touch that down. Washington, D.C.'s News Talk, 1450 AM, WOS, at 95.9 FM. Information is power. This is the reason that WL makes a great partner also uh, for this show because on this show, we are trying to give you information that will help you to understand co-op so that you could either join a co-op, uh, so get, get all of the benefits of being in a co-op, or start your own to help solve whatever community problems you're having. And this is what the Federation has been doing now for 52 years in 18 states in the District of Columbia. Uh, with seven states having their very, very active participation and seven board members on their board. And that governance structure is what makes co-op so great, that the members elect the board and then the board set in the motion, and the board normally hires management and also holds management accountable and do that evaluation. Cornelius Blanding is that management for the Federation. He's the executive director. And Cornelius, what are you going to do on, so we've got to dinner tonight honoring Dr. Uh, Jesse Jackson, and then you go to Epps, Alabama on Friday. Friday, yes. So, uh, so we leave here, Birmingham, heading west. Uh, Epps, Alabama is about 100 miles west of Birmingham, passing through Tuscaloosa, Alabama, for those who are not familiar with West Alabama. Epps, Alabama is the home of our training center, our Rural Training and Research Center. As an organization, uh, we own collectively of roughly about 1,300 acres of land uh, that's divided among about four tracts. 
One of those tracks is a 375 acre track in which where we we'll all be consent descending on for the, the start of the annual meeting officially. Uh, but at that annual meeting on Friday, we have um, some of our other partners there, USDA, who's a value partner of our organization, uh, working with the United States Department of Agriculture. So we have a resource panel and somebody pretty much from every agency within USDA present talking about their agency, talking about their programs, talking about what what's needed to be eligible for those programs and how do we as an organization, but how do our individual members, our farmers, those landowners, those cooperatives, how do they access those programs? Uh, so that's on Friday, and then we finish up with workshop. We start uh, workshops in between, workshops, again, on cooperative development, workshops on uh, credit union development, uh, workshops on heirs' property and other things, uh, forestry tours. Uh, so a number of activities to really keep our membership engaged and understanding what's there at their training center. More importantly, what do they have access to with, through the partners and what work the staff will support them on. Well, I know you came on to educate me <clears throat> and the audience on whenever the government shutdown, how that government shutdown pass its way through to really hurt the farmer, mm -hmm. okay, so that they could not get the loans that they needed or work through USDA to get whatever loans that they needed uh, so they could start their planning and all of that. Mm -hmm. So is it, these are the kinds of things that you'll be talking about there? Yeah. Well, as you know, we're long past the government shutdown now. There's still a lot of remnants from that because when resources dry up, they leave they leave some residue somewhere. It's usually left with the least of these. Uh, but we, uh, we have the agencies down really talking about a number of things. Uh, one, strengthen, continue to strengthen the relationship and really, really getting a good understanding one-on-one -on -one about what these programs are about and how they can be utilized and, more importantly, why are they so important. So, so we have a number of things, we, uh, and it'd be a chance for the government agencies for USDA to listen to some of its, to its clients, our members. Okay. So that, that's what you have Friday morning, Friday afternoon. Then what else mm -hmm. do you do on Friday? So, so on Friday after that, we have a series of, of again, work, uh, workshops. We have a cooperative panel to start off with where we're bringing co-ops from uh, multiple, from four different states there to kind of talk about their co-op, their work, and the rest of the membership, the rest of the audience can hear from them and interact with them. Uh, we, we give updates on the Farm Bill, which is extremely important for everybody in this country, but especially for farmers and landowners. Uh, it kind of dictates the programs that they have access to. It dictates the resources and where they will go. Uh, so we'll be talking about that so that our membership and our folks understand that and also giving USDA an opportunity to answer questions and talk about things that we might not uh, know or some things that are just coming out in the pipe. Uh, but then we have a series of workshops. Uh, our workshops this year include uh, some credit union roundtables, um, there's a heirs property workshop, as always. Uh, there's a co cooperative development finance and marketing workshop, uh, as always. But then there are things like uh, farm safety, food safety training that we do. So a series of workshops that we think that benefit the members based on the work that we've done throughout the years and some of the challenges we've heard, we try to cater our workshops to that so we, people can get some questions answered and get new information. So you're really looking at the fifth principle of cooperatives. That's this training information. That yep. you constant, yeah, exactly. So you know, that constant education is a big piece for us. Uh, training and education. Yeah, that's definitely. That's exactly what Friday is about for us. That's what the programs of the organization are about throughout the year. But that's exactly what Friday is about. That's a big piece of one of the reasons I like co-ops. It's trying to help everyday people learn how to run a business, how to mm -hmm. how to get along, how to. Uh, solve conflict and all of that. Okay, so that's what you're doing. You got anything else? I mean, you haven't got to the best part of Friday for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that that would be that that would be that entertainment, the uh, fish fry, right. <laughs> the fish fry and entertainment. Yeah, so you know we can't get together and and put out all this information and work and talk and network without uh, having an exclamation point at the end. So the fish fry is usually a hit for everybody. So we're gonna fry up some fish, we're gonna eat some fish, we're gonna eat fish and, and take in some libations and some and some dancing, which you always love, Vernon. Yep. Yep. Like moving the body. One of my grandchildren told me when she was three, move the body, Poppy, move the body. That's, that's sort of the same thing my doctors tell me. 
Okay. So now we go into Saturday morning. Mm-hmm. And so Saturday we get down to the crux of the, the business, the crux of the organization. We start out with a prayer breakfast. Uh, you know, so it's important to kind of get people moving around and, and we do a prayer breakfast. And this year we, we actually have a Miss Maddie Mack Pretty Hat prayer breakfast. Miss mm-hmm. Maddie Mack was a longtime board member from the state of Kentucky and she was known for some beautiful hats she would wear around the uh, annual meeting and whenever you saw her. Miss Maddie Mack would always say to the women in the crowd during the annual meeting that you women got to get back to wearing your hats. And so, Ms. unfortunately, we lost Miss Maddie Pack of, uh, this year. And we decided to, hey, one of her favorite events during the annual meeting was that prayer breakfast and the opportunity to wear her hats and talk about her hats and really kind of push everybody else, all the women to start back wearing hats. So we decided to honor her in this, bre- this prayer breakfast this year. Uh, so we got the Miss Maddie Mack Pretty Hat Prayer Breakfast. Uh, then we do that business. We have the annual business meeting where the uh, board gives its reports, the officers of the board gives its reports to the membership, and we ta- take care of any new business. And then I, as executive director, go over to pretty much talk about the state of the federation so that the membership understand their organization. Uh, but then we do something that's very unique where we break down into state caucuses. And all the states gather around and they talk amongst themselves based on the business of the organization or the reports that they've heard. And they then present a report back to the uh, to the overall membership, but more importantly to us as a staff. And we call it our marching order. So they kind of talk about what what's going on in each state so we all can hear that. And they talk about some of the things that they would like to see happen. And so we have staff who are recording the, the, the notes, who taking up the note from each one of the states, but also recording what they've heard. And we try our best to convert that to our work plan for the year moving forward, make sure that our programs address those things as we're soliciting uh, programs and resources from various agencies within the government or elsewhere. So where do you have the election for the board members? The, so the election is during this year, Alabama, Arkansas, and Texas is up for a vote. So our board members have three-year terms, and every three years, they three different states come up for a vote. And so the board, so in those caucuses or at those at those state annual meetings prior to the annual meeting, they will elect their board meeting. So some of the states will elect their board meeting in their own annual meeting for the state, and they're just presented to us at the at the annual meeting. But some of them go through that process during the state caucuses. Every state caucus looks different. It's up to the state. They determine what they talk about, what they decide on in their state caucuses. And some of them are actually electing board members during their state caucus. So you, how many members of the board do you have? We have seven. Okay, so there's seven from each of those seven, mm-hmm. one from each of those states. Yes. All right, fantastic. So what are some of the issues you expect to see happening or you will be working on? Yeah, so so this year is a, is a, is a, is a busy year for us. Uh, we're doing a lot. We have a lot of bylaws recommendations. So our organization is a 52-year organization, and uh, I don't think our, our bylaws. We're updating our bylaws at this point. As an organization, we've grown, and so I, we're just basically changing those bylaws to reflect the growth of the organization. And some of the things are just some outdated things that we got to get caught up on, and uh, some of the other things are, are really st- core to the structure of the organization. But we'll be dealing with some bylaws issues this year. Okay. But I was more interested in the, the kinds of issues that the farmers or your members are concerned about they want to see you working on. What do you well, expect? Well, well, well we're, we're, we're definitely going to see, see and hear a lot of that this year at the annual meeting. Uh, but what I tell you now is uh, because we're in constant contact with our membership through our state offices, through our staff. And so there's some things that we're working on all the time. But a big issue for us goes right back at the heart of those numbers that you and I talked about, that loss of land from 15 million acres to two a little over 2 million acres. Uh, The number one, uh, a big reason for that is heirs' property. And so we're constantly dealing with our membership on issues around heirs' property, how to save and protect their land, how to put it in wills or estate plans and et cetera. But how do they secure their land? And with securing their land, how do they access the appropriate resources to do the the things that they need to do? So that's a big issue for us and is always a big one for us. Uh, But we'll be talking about a lot of other issues in terms of the uh, access to various programs, what access our, our membership, black farmers and landowners have, what are some of the perceived challenges that they have, and really getting a chance to talk through those challenges with USDA folks in person. Okay. So, Cornelius, what would you like to leave people with? What message would you like to leave people with? 
So, um, one, first of all, if if you're not engaged in a cooperative, get engaged. And find out more about co- cooperatives and get engaged. And if there's any way to be connected to the Federation, we would, we would welcome that. Um, but I would say cooperatives are a way to address big issues. Thank you, Cornelius. We're going to take our next break. And I know you've got to go to your annual meeting. Thanks a lot. Everybody, we'll be right back. Thank you. Washington, D.C.'s News Talk. 1450 AM WOS at 95.9 FM. Welcome back, everybody. This is Vernon Oaks, and it's Everything Co-op. And we're live from Birmingham, Alabama. Mr. Cornelius Bland, he was the executive director of the Federation of Southern Co-ops, talked to us the first half of our show today, and he has to go to his board meeting, which he is off to. The National Co-op Bank sponsors this program, NCB's mission is to support and be an advocate for America's cooperatives and their members, especially in low-income communities, by providing innovative financial and related services. And too often in these seven states that the Federation has offices in and around these U.S. there's low-income communities and NCBS, Cornelius has said, has been a great partner to the Federation over the years. So what we're going to do this to the rest of this show is R.L. Condra, who is the vice president of advocacy for NCB, has decided he wants to ask me some questions. So, R.L., good morning. Good morning, Vernon. So, welcome to the show, and what do you want to know? Well, it's first, it's just great to be down south, down in Birmingham. It's always good to be with you. And uh, I guess today, we're going to, this morning, we're going to flip the script on you. Yeah. So you've been doing this for quite a while, but I want to talk about the radio show with you. But first of all, are you originally from from the district? Where are you from? No, I'm originally from Bluefield, West Virginia. And this show has been going on. This October will be six years. And if you recall, we were only going to do it for one month six years ago, the month of October, which is co-op month. But in West Virginia, my father being... Uh, worked on a railroad, the blue-collar job, and my grandfather worked in the mines. And so there was no co-op around. There was no, like in the farms and stuff, you might grow up on a farm and you understand co-ops. We did not understand co-ops at all. There was none of that. Yeah. Well, you, you say you did the show for six years. How did you how did you become involved with the show? How did how did the show originate? Wow. Where did that come? I think this is a great little story that you tell. It's, great, it's really fascinating. Great question is that I, I learned about co-ops when I started managing them, I still have a property management company. So that's where I learned about co-ops. I started managing limited equity housing co-ops and regular market rate co-ops. And I got fascinated with this model when everyday people sometimes did not have a high school education would make really great decisions, long-term decisions on what was best for all of the members of that housing. And, 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 the, and the housing could could have been an apartment building for people out there that don't know what a co-op. It could, be, could have been an apartment building turned into a co-op where the members owned it. So I got interested and excited about it, so I joined a Potomac Association of Housing Co-ops, which is a regional, D.C., Maryland, and Virginia, and got active there. And then I joined the National Association and then became their president. So as the president, my cousin Pat Thornton invited me on her show in WOL. And uh, so I went to her show to talk about housing, in particular housing co-ops. And when we came out, Karen Jackson, who runs that show for WOL for Kathy Hughes Radio 1, she came out and put her finger in my face and you said, you should have your own show. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and I, I, I had never, I didn't think about it, but that's how it came about. And uh, so Pat produces the show in, in D.C. And I like that you've been our producer on the road, and thank you for that. You're welcome. Um, and so it's just, again, it was going to be for one month to celebrate co-op month six years ago and people seem to like it and i've had most of the people in in major positions in the u.s on the show and i'm getting now where we used to have to go and sort of beg people to be on now i get people calling to say they want to be on yeah. and it's it's great i really enjoy it you know you you mentioned that when you stepped out that you were asked you should do your own show so you you did not have a radio background or anything like that right you just you did, you did the interview and then i mean this is like america's got talent kind of thing <laughs> well, where they just kind of found you well kind of sort of and i had been on wol uh, which would be now about 25 years ago 
for two seasons, uh, uh, like four months each. And I, the show was called Home Ownership, Making Your Dream Come True. And so we were talking about the, ho- the process of buying a home to try to help everyday people buy their own home. Uh, a friend of mine who was a Stanford graduate MBA, he asked me to be on a show. And at that point, asked me to host it. And I was going, are you crazy? <laughs> me? So we did it. And then WOL was on uh, 4th and 8th Street Northeast. And Kathy Hughes had a little trailer. And I would see her every day. And she would give me pointers on how to improve my show. And that was just really great. Now, I've been out there six years now, and they have 53 stations and a TV station. I haven't seen her one time. And would not have expected to. She's just grown like that. But she's a phenomenal lady. That she, she helped me. So this time when Karen said, with finger and face, you should have your own show, I wasn't scared of it because I'd had it like 20 years before I'd had an experience of being on a show. Wow. Wow. What are some of the changes in the co-op industry? Since you've been doing the show, you you have interviewed all types of people from the industry, different sectors of, of the co-op sector and the co-op industry. What are some of the changes that you've seen over the years, some well, of the trends maybe? Well, what, what the main trend is that co-ops are developed to solve community problems in the most of the cases. If there's a housing shortage, you create a co-op to help it. If there's uh, employment problems, you can create uh, worker cooperatives to solve that problem. If there's something wrong in uh, the Anacostia River and it's dirty, you could create a co-op to help clean it up. So in this case, in, in uh, we're here in Birmingham because when they were trying to vote, the, the folks in power wouldn't sell the black farmers gas and the sharecroppers, they kicked off the land because they know that if people have the right to vote, then that gives them power in a democracy. So they created a, a co-op to buy a truck here and go across state lines and buy their gas. So there was a problem, and the community came together and shared whatever limited resources. It, each individual farmer could not have bought a truck, but they can, they can share their resources and then get accomplished what they could not do individually. Their financial resources, their experiences, their talents, their time, and put that together into a co-op and, and then get what they need. And like I said earlier, making decisions that's best for the group and not necessarily what's best for the, the individual. That's the main thing, the trend that I have seen in every co-op. The only thing that, um, that just, just seems to be a bigger need, if there's anything sort of like in this environment of the tax cut helps the rich and the powerful capitalistic uh, companies, that tax cut, and so the folks at the bottom end uh, don't get it, and this gap, this equality gap, this income gap gets bigger and bigger and bigger. The rich get more and more, and the poor gets less and less. Yeah. Okay. And so there's just a much bigger need to me right now of co-ops, of people in that bottom end forming co-ops, and then just basically taking charge. Yeah. I mean, we, we now have presidential candidates talking about co-ops. And, have, and they're part of their economic plans, and the governors have put in place some of these things, and cities have uh, passed legislation to help create more co-ops and provide technical assistance. It's just really taken off. Even when I've, since I've been doing this for the last few years, it's just really the a, a very popular uh, and, you trend, know, yeah. trend, yeah. So DeBasio in New York is... They put up like two and a half million each year to help worker co-ops get started and give them the technical assistance and the training to help them get started and going. Uh, in Madison, Wisconsin, there's been about a million five each year for that. They get five years that they put in place. Uh, Richmond has a communities building wealth uh, group that sort of how can you help people build wealth? And so this is the other reason I like co-op for black and brown people is that you have a chance, I think it's the third principle, you put something in, you put some money in to join, but when there's a profit or surplus, you get that back. Mm-hmm. And that's why somebody can go from being a maid making five to 10 bucks an hour, and I had somebody on the show two weeks ago in D.C. that these six ladies, Latin ladies, started a, a, a co-op and they have services, they clean houses for people. And so they went from five to 10 bucks an hour to 20 to $25 an hour. Mm-hmm. Okay, because not only they get the hourly wage, but they also benefit on the profits. That they so how do we get the word out? Because 
well, let's take these ladies. They work hard. They have families. They're they're just trying to keep it going day by day. They don't have time to do research or even hear about costs. So how do we get the word out better? Other than this, other than a great show like this. Well, this was the reason for the show, and the reason that I wanted to do it, and the reason I take my hat off to Chuck Snyder every time I can think about it is because Chuck, as the president of the National Co-op Bank. He caught the vision. But he did finally tell me that he didn't do this because of the vision. He just wanted to support me for one month. <laughs> and I, I like that he thought enough about me to support me for one month. But eventually he got on the vision. He's been supporting us. The bank has been supporting us every year financially. And not only financially, it is uh, they have been inspiring. You guys have been very inspiring to us and giving us ideas of what to do and how to do it and when to do it and buying this equipment so we can be here live in Birmingham. So. It, it's, and this is, again, why I like the co-op world. It's a sharing of information, sharing of talents to get the word out. Now, what else can we do? I'm seeing a book to come out of these shows, uh, trying to get somebody help to listen to all of them and getting the book out. I have still haven't figured out how to do it, but I've talked to a couple of people that they could come back and look, listen to each show and do a press release to send it to the Wall Street Journal and the Washington Post and the New York Times and the Chicago Herald or whomever and talk about this co-op and how do we can get it out. Jessica Gordon-Nimhart, who wrote the book Collective Carriage, has been working on a project to take that book and put them into what I call cartoons. They have another term for it, but it, it's in, a, in books for children, mm -hmm. okay, and then get those into schools. But we've got to look for more and more ways, and that's why it's a great question, Ariel, more and more ways of getting people to understand co-ops and see how they can get them done. Sounds great. Well, you know, I have to thank Chuck Snyder, too, because I am not a radio person, and I'm <laughs> now on the radio. I should have called my mom, told her yeah. to tune in. Yeah. So uh, it's great to be here with you, and I really enjoyed producing the show, helping produce the show with you on the road, and uh, it's always good to be down south, down in Birmingham, so... Well, you being from Arkansas, it makes I guess it really makes you feel like home. Me being from Bluefield, West Virginia, you can see a lot of the similarities growing up in the South down here. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the, the, our our web page is everything.coop, www.everything.coop, and you can tell your mom in about a week or two, Pat will have this loaded up on the on on the web page, and your mom can go in and listen to it. And anybody else out there that want to listen to this show or the last the show from the last six years can go on. All right. Well, I've listened to enough radio. I know that we can do a tease. So uh, in the next segment, I'm going to ask you who your most memorable guest is. So I want you to think about that, and we will uh, talk about that at the next the next turn. Okay. So so the, we'll get ready to take our next break. All right. That sounds good. I don't think we're ready. So let me just say this about this. There's not one guest that's my favorite guest. I've got many of them. So during this break, when we get ready to come back, I'll try to list four or five of them. And what they've said that has sort of stuck in my brain, Dame Pauline Green and Papa Sin. Yeah. And there's a guy from NCBA, and I can't remember his name. He said something on the show that I'll never forget. So it's just, it's just been a lot of people. That's a lot of people. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know how much more time we'll have after that, but we can talk about a lot of different things in terms of what the bank is doing. And I really want to go back to your question. Maybe I'll spend a little time now back to this question of what are some of the things that I see in the co-op. The, the one is getting people involved, like in credit unions. There are consumer co-ops. Consumer co-ops are those co-ops that are owned and controlled by... I hear the music, so... so... We'll be right back, everybody. Please don't touch that down. <laughs> Washington, D.C.'s News Talk, 1450 AM WOS at 95.9 FM. Welcome back, everybody. This is Vernon Oaks. The program is Everything Co-op, and I am being interviewed by R.L. Condra, who's the Vice President of Advocacy for the National Cooperative Bank. And we're live in Birmingham, Alabama, where we're down here for the Federation's 52nd Annual Meeting. So Birmingham is hot. 
and there's a lot going on and there's some great people that we get a chance to meet with and talk to and then we'll go to Epps, or at least I'll go to Epps. Uh, RL's going back to D.C. on tomorrow morning, but I'll go to Epps, Alabama, and I'll have a chance to just really talking to home folk. So, R.L., what else? You, what other questions do you have? Well, I have to say, the thing I'm jealous about is not being at Epps to see all those great people and all that great conversation. But Cornelius mentioned this. This is the fish fry. <laughs> Fried catfish, probably from Alabama, hush puppies, french fries, it is. You can't. You can't get that everywhere. So you, your your southernness is coming. That's out. right. That's right. I, I, I would. That's a. It's, it's a. I love some fried fish. But uh, one of the things I want to ask you, Vernon, is you know we mentioned this. Your most memo- memorable guests, and you, you touched on it a little bit. But are some some of the things they've talked about, and the, I guess the some of the impressions they they had on you. Well, that first month, I told you, six years ago, October, um, we had guests, and Papa Sin is a, a short man, very dark-skinned, from Senegal, and he worked with the NCBA. He was one of our guests, and he was inducted into the Co-op Hall of Fame. These are the co-op heroes, those that have, most of the case, worked their whole life in co-ops and creating co-ops, and he talked about the need in Senegal was uh, housing. They were on the outskirts. And so they created a housing co-op and then from the, it was in the suburbs and so then they needed transportation back into the city and so they created a transportation co-op. So based on the need. And then there as the, the housing as it grew, this community grew, and the kids were going to school in the city, they figured out they needed their own schools in the suburbs so they created a school co-op so they had three co-ops going and he said something about taxes that i'll never forget well first thing he said was co-ops are created to solve a community need and that's the first time i've heard it i've heard that so many times since then from our different guests but that's the first time i heard it and he said that you pay taxes in anticipation of what the government needs to do for you I've never thought about it that way. So I'll pay a dollar taxes now knowing that what I'll need from the government in the future are roads or schools or transportation or police force or army to protect our country. But I pay taxes today in anticipation of something that I'll need the government from in the future. So it's just a whole new way for me to see the world. And this was this little classy strong human being from Senegal talking about this and uh, he just opened my eyes in a whole lot of different ways and I've I've had an opportunity to talk to him a couple times since then and I've threatened to go to Senegal I haven't got there yet you gotta go <laughs> you gotta you go. have to go he's he's in the cooperative hall of fame as well he's a yeah he's that's a, when I first met him because he had gotten inducted that year so that was probably six years ago and that's how I got the chance to introduce him he was here for that for that meeting and so second person is Dane Pauline Green. Dane Pauline Green I had met in 2011 at the United Nations. It just turned out I sat beside her at the United Nations, and she said something that just I knew she was strong and forceful and straight. But we I ended up talking to her on the show, and she called in from Canada or somewhere, and I was talking about the third principle. You put some money in. And, and I was going to the fourth principle. She said, oh, no, wait a minute, Vernon, wait a minute, go back. They put money in, but they also get money back when there's this surplus or this profit. And that's where the creating of wealth comes from. Okay. I, I just found that phenomenal. In most cases, like in food co-ops, the, the, food, the people in the food co-ops, the employees, may get a dollar more than in a regular grocery store, and they have better benefits. But in a food co-op, if they're, when there's profits, and if it's a employee base or a employee and consumer base, then they get some more money on top of that. The other thing she said that I talk about all the time this is Dame Pauline Green, who was the president of ICA, International Cooperative Alliance. She said that co ops help people to come out of poverty with dignity. And that with dignity is what? Just coming out of poverty is one thing, where you can do it with yourself, making those decisions, learning how to run a business. 
uh, learning how to solve problems together. When there's conflict, there's going to be conflict with two or more people. So when you have conflict, I know that from marriage, but when you have conflict, <laughs> how do you solve that conflict, okay? Uh, that's what you learn in co-ops. And so then you get this dignity, this self-worth, this sort of this whole sense of who I am as a human being. And I just, that just, I fell in love with co-ops all over again and talking to her. So those are two people. There was a guy from NCBA, and I can't get his name. I may go back and listen to it. He was telling about farming in, in Central America and how they go and help. And what they learned, whatever this animal was, I don't know if it was coming, rabbits or something or another, they found out the way to keep these animals out of the farms was to take women's pantyhose and go to the barbershop and put human hair inside women's pantyhose, and therefore these animals would not come out and destroy the farm. Wow. <laughs> okay. So it's just small things that when you learn about co-ops and people are sharing information, and that's this, this whole fifth principle. When you go to this meeting, when I, we go tomorrow and today and tomorrow and Saturday, you will see people giving information away. Same thing with the housing costs when I would go to their annual meetings. People give information to each other without holding it back. And too often in a capitalistic world, I got it. I have information I don't want to share with you because you're my competitor. I don't get that same sense right. in this whole co-op. Uh, so those are two of the things. And the other, again, somebody from NCBA talking about international farming was that there was she had, was visiting a farm, and on the left side of the street, if you will, was a member of the co-op. And on the right side of the street was a non-member. The, on the left side of the street, you could see the greenery, the plushness the, of the crop. And on the right side, they were withering and dying. And I said, well, what made the difference? She said, the information that the person got in the co-op. One, and because they were buying together, and because they were purchasing together with a purchasing co-op, they got better seed. They had better information. They got better fertilizer. They got better information about when to water and all of these things, so they had a much better crop. To the point, she said that the, this little, the owner of that co-op said before they joined the co-op, they had more months than they had money. Right. Okay, and if you've been from the South for poor neighborhoods, you know what that means, that your money goes away at the end of your month. Most of the time, it was more month than money means that at the, the end of the month, you didn't have money. What she was talking about was uh, this particular farmer was that when they may run out of money in December, January, in those winter months, they didn't have money to feed and clothe and send their kids to school. But once they joined a co-op, they had more money than months. Right. They were had savings. And they learned how to save and how to put together. First, they got better uh, money for their product. They had better product and they got more money for it than they would have done because people are, they had to get to more markets by having a purchasing co-op. So there's this, all these different benefits, knowledge, uh, uh, getting better uh, seed, and having better markets. They got end up with more money so that they then can send their kids to school year-round or feed them year-round. Right. Yeah, great. So I want, I'm going to set you up on this question, and I think you're ready for this, though. A wish list. Who would be some of the guests that you have not had on the show that if you could just snap a finger, you could get them on the show? Pope. <laughs> the Pope, his family, the, he grew up in Argentina, but his family was from somewhere in Europe. And the story that Dame Pauline Green told me, his father set him and his brothers down and told him about the benefits of co-ops, and he's all for co-ops. So I really would like to have that on the show. <laughs> I tried several years to get Bernie Sanders because I saw him talk about co-ops. I saw videos of him talking about co-ops. John Lewis, he got the Ether Withers uh, Award two years ago for 50 years. He's been right with the Federation uh, since its beginning. Oh, I wanted Michelle Obama. I wanted her I more knew so. It. I, I knew that was coming. I wanted her more so than Barack. And uh, one of my friends said, why do you love Michelle? I said, because she's smart, she's beautiful, she's intelligent, and she sticks by her man. 
Right. <laughs> okay. Uh, you never heard any problem with her in Baraka. You know that there were because <laughs> whenever there's two or more, there's going to be conflict. <laughs> <laughs> but they were always together. And so I would love to have a Barack, but I'll take Michelle. <laughs> I knew she was your favorite. That's why I set you up. So if there's any listeners out there, <laughs> In the D.C. area, that uh, have a have a contact with the with the first lady, you Harry, know, yeah. Another one is Harry Belafonte, and wow. I, at least I got to his uh, scheduling secretary as further as I've gotten, the closest I've gotten with him. His story is, and David Thompson, who has written a couple of books, Weaver of Dreams. Uh, he's a British chap originally, but he's out in California. Uh, he's writing a book on on blacks also uh, in cooperative world. And his, he has an interesting story, and you could go on everything.coop and listen to our my interviews with him. He's been on three or four times. But he's told me the story of Harry Belafonte tried to rent a room uh, in New York, uh, rent an apartment, and he couldn't get it because of his color of his skin. Wow. Uh, so he got his agent to go get it, and uh, he brought, brought Harry the contract. Harry signed it, and before they knew, he had already moved in. He later... Bought the building, <laughs> of course, <laughs> and he made it into a housing court. Wow! And then a lot of artists were living there. Washington D.C.'s News Talk, fourteen fifty a.m. W.O.L. at ninety five point nine FM.